أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم يغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Concerning the mistakes that we've been dealing with that are common in the prayer of the individual as well as the prayer when a person is in the jamaat we continue to mention some of the mistakes inshallah today that are committed by the imams who lead the muslims in the prayer as well as those mistakes that are done when people are praying in the jamaat many of which as i mentioned a number of times we really don't deal with because there are a lot of really important glaring mistakes that need to be touched upon and brought to the attention of the community anybody and everybody so a responsibility to learn as much as we can learn about the correct way to perform your prayer as an individual or as the imam today our imam didn't come so someone from the community stepped forward to lead the prayer not any Amr Bakr Zaid should step forward to lead the prayer. The one who should step forward to lead the prayer isn't even the one who just memorized the Quran, but he doesn't know the ahkam of the salah. No doubt when we look for the criterion of who should lead the prayer, then the Qari and the Hafiz, he's up there. But the Qari and the Hafiz should be an individual who knows what he's doing when he leads the prayer. And not be like the situation in the vast majority of Masajid of the Muslims. The imam, he's getting a ratib, he's get a salary, and he's not doing his job. Doesn't come close to being responsible for making the community and the people who are praying behind him realize the significance and the seriousness of praying this prayer correctly. And Imam Ahmed has some nice kalam about the haq that the people who are praying have over the imam. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no doubt he was loved by his companions, so he wasn't hesitant and he wasn't shy to correct them in all of these issues. And we're bringing them to your attention week after week after week. But again, it's part of the responsibility of the administration of any masjid. Put the imam who's going to lead the people in prayer. And let him be someone who, <coughs> who knows what he's doing. <coughs> <coughs> From the mistake <coughs> of some of the uh, imma. And also those of us who pray, especially those of us who are not Arabs, is that when people pray, they make the wrong pronunciation of important matters in the prayer. Like the word Allahu Akbar. You'll find the person who is not an Arab many times, he would say, when he wants to make the takbiratul ihram, he would say, Allahu Akbar. And he elongates the first alif, the hamza. He doesn't say Allahu Akbar. He says Allahu Akbar. Either in the first takbir or any of the takbirat to move from position to position. And this statement is a statement of kufr. It's a statement of disbelief. If a person says Allahu Akbar, is wrong. We don't say that he becomes a kafir, but it is a statement of kufr. Because in the Arabic language, if you have a word that begins with an alif, like Allah's name, Allah. You have a word, Allah. 
that word, Allah. And then before that word, if you have a question mark, then you're going to elongate the pronunciation of that because there's a question mark, an alif, a hamza, and then the letter that comes after it is another hamza. So you say, Allahu amarakum bihada, Allahu amarakum bihada. That's what the Prophet said to his people in the Quran. Did Allah order you people to worship these things? And you don't read that by saying, Ah, Allah amarakum bihada. You don't read it like that. You have to make the idgham of those two alifs and bring them together and elongate it and say, Allahu amarakum bihada. So if the person is praying and he says, Allahu Akbar what he's saying is is Allah the greatest is Allah the greatest so every time he's going to a position he's asking the question of kufr is Allah the greatest is Allah the greatest so we have to tighten up on that and an extension of that for those of us who are not Arabs and we all need to work on this is our pronunciation of the ayat of the Quran obviously especially surah al-fatiha and not say Allazina and Amta Alehim Walazalin Walazalin, but to read those words and those haruf correctly. This is a mistake that is not acceptable, especially for people who have been Muslims for a long time. You have to take time out to do your best to try to raise off of yourself the lahan in the pronunciation. And we all have that because we're not Arabs. But if you practice and if you're taught, those things will be taken away, inshallah. Second mistake, Ikhwani, and this is really common, especially with the people who are of the opinion of reading Surah Al-Fatiha behind the Imam. The Imam, he says, Allahu Akbar, he does the dua al-istiftah, and then he reads Surah Al-Fatiha. And then after reading Surah Al-Fatiha, the Imam pauses for a period of time to allow the people behind him to read the Surah Al-Fatiha. This is not from what is authentic from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You're not going to find any delil sahih or sarih. Nothing is authentic and nothing is clear. Now a person could say, but there are a hadith that says that the people praying behind the imam, they can read and they should read Surah Al-Fatiha behind the imam. So why wouldn't the imam give them the time to do it? Because the one who told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa that you can read Surah Al-Fatiha behind the Imam, although he told them that, he never made a pause, a sekta, a pause, to give them time to read it. So if an individual is of the opinion that he has to read Surah Al-Fatiha behind the Imam, and we've done that before, it's an issue of ikhtilaf. If you're of that opinion, then you should read Surah Al-Fatiha in a low voice within yourself. But we think that's a weak position. Why is it weak? It's a weaker position because the imam is going to start reading the Quran after he finishes Surah Al-Fatiha. And while he's reading another surah of the Quran, you're reading Fatiha. And Allah Ta'ala commanded you in the Quran, if the Quran is read, then be quiet and listen to it. But still, there are some proofs that could be understood because he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't read anything but Fatiha. So if the person wants to read Al-Fatiha, he reads it to himself in a low voice. But it's not for the imam to give him those few seconds or moments. He just waits for a minute, 30 seconds. This is not from the sunnah. So the imam shouldn't do that. After reading Surah Al-Fatiha, he takes a breath, and then he goes right into the next ayat that he wants to read, the next surah that he wants to read in the salat that is Jahriya. The next issue, ikhwani, from the mistakes from the imams as well, this is pretty common, is that on Thursday night, Thursday night, Yom al Khamis, Thursday night is actually Laylatul Juma, the night of Al Juma, the night precedes the day. So on Thursday night for Salat al Isha, in many masajid around the world, if you go into that masjid for Salat al Isha, the Imam is going to read Salat al is uh, going to read Surah al Juma, because it's Juma at night. Tomorrow we're going to make Salat al Juma. So for Isha, you'll find that the Imams stick to that Salat of Al Isha and Juma being read all the time. There is a hadith that says this is what should be done, and the Prophet did this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it's not authentic. It's not authentic. 
It's not authentic at all. And Salat al-Isha, he used to make it shorter than the duration that it takes to read Salat al Juma or Surat al Juma. It would be enough time to read Surat al Duha, Surat al Shams, which is shorter than al Juma. It's not haram to read Juma, but to think that you have to do it every single Thursday night, Salat al Isha, there's nothing that proves it's mustahab. Nothing. And there's nothing that proves that it is from the sunnah. And if a person does it all the time, all the time, it becomes an innovation. He has created a thing in the religion that is not from what the Prophet brought, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So if a person wants to read for every single khutbatul eid or the khutbah of Friday, he wants to read surat al-a'la and surat al-ghashia. That's all he sticks with. That is highly recommended, and that's the sunnah. If he wants to read Salatul Fajr on Friday, Friday morning at Fajr, he wants to read Hal Atal Insan, Hainu Min He wants to read that every week. And he wants to read Surah Al Sajda every week, every week. That's the sunnah. He wants to read Surah Al Qaf. That's highly recommended on Friday to do that. But Surah the Salat of Al Isha. Always sticking to Surah Al Juma every week. It's nothing that shows that it is from the Sunnah or is highly recommended, Mustahab, and to keep doing it all the time is an innovation in the religion and it should be avoided. Now we come, Ikhwani, to a really important issue. We touched on it very briefly in a previous talk, and that is the mushkila of praying in the Jama'at, and we're making Al Musabaqa. And al Musawa with the Imam, where we are racing the Imam, either going before him or moving at the same time that he moves. And again, this is the responsibility of the Imam to deal with this. And it's also the responsibility of the ulama and the du'at and the talabutul ilm. It's the responsibility of the people to tell each other about this mushkila because. This is what we found with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turning around and telling the people this issue. This is what we found the companions dealing with in this issue. This is what we found the tabi'een dealing with. This is how they dealt with this particular issue. Let me first say, anyone who makes the takbiratul ihram before the imam, his salat is batil. He doesn't have any prayer. So if he says Allahu Akbar to start off and the imam goes after him, he doesn't have any salat. And if anyone says, Allahu Akbar, he makes taslim, he makes taslim before the iman, salamu alaykum wa then it's batila, he has no prayer. But if the imam makes the takbiratul ihram and then he makes it, and he's racing the imam and going with the imam, then what he's doing is haram, but we're not going to say that his salat is batila. But he's making something that is from the major sins. It's haram, but I'm not going to say his salat is batila. But if he makes this takbir before this, the imam, it's batil. And if he makes it to sleep before the imam, it is batil. And there's absolutely no fight and no benefit for a person doing this. There's no benefit whatsoever. First of all, Anas ibn Malik and what was collected by the imam Muslim, he said that they prayed with the Prophet wasallam. He prayed with them as the imam. After the salat, he turned around. And he said to them after completing the prayer, Ya ayyuhal nas, inni imamukum, fala tasbukuni birrukur, wala bil sujood, wala bil qiyam, wala bil insiraf. Hey you people, I'm your imam and I'm leading you in the prayer. I'm leading you. So therefore, don't race me in the rukur. Don't race me when we're making sajda. Don't race me when we get up to stand up. Don't race me even after the salat is done. Don't get up and run off. Stay sitting there until I get up and I leave. Now that was doing his time in terms of sitting there until he got up and left. As for our time, anyone can get up and he can leave whenever he wants to leave. But there's an ayat of the Quran that describes the believers that if they are with the Prophet wasallam and they are with him in an assembly, the real believer doesn't get up to leave until they ask him for permission. So right now, anybody can get up and he can leave after the prayer. But he prohibited them from those four things. Don't race me 
in the Roku, don't race me. In the sajda, don't race me. Going up in Qiyam, don't race me when it's time to leave. So he addressed the issue. He told the community. The imam tells the community. Before the prayer, he used to tell the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La tu sabiquni. Don't race me. The imam comes and he starts praying. He doesn't say anything to the community. We need to be reminded about our mobile phones. I mean, many of us, we don't like that mobile phone going off for the salat. But it's easy for anybody to forget that. So the imam turns around and he tells people, hey, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do that. Also from what we have in this issue, it's the hadith of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. He mentioned to the people describing the condition of the one who races the imam, alladhi yakhfadu wa yarfa'u qabl al-imam, innama nasiyatuhu biyad shaytan he said that the one who goes up and down before the imam, his forehead is in the hands of a shaitan. So that's an indication, that's a proof that doing this is impermissible and it's a major sin because of the description that has been given to the one who did this. We know something's a major sin. If the Quran and the Sunnah said it's a major sin. We know that something is a major sin if there's a had that is connected to it. Someone who does this, his hand gets chopped off, major sin. Someone does this, he's flogged, major sin. We know that thing is a major sin because of the description that has been attached to it. Don't be wasters. Don't waste. For verily, the wasters are the brothers of a shaitan. So if a person is a brother of a shaitan, if something makes you a brother of shaitan, then that's a major sin. Don't do it. So the one who is speeding in the prayer, raising up, going down before the imam, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that his forehead is in the hands of a shaitan. He's being controlled by iblis. He mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, ama yakhsha alladhi yarfa'u ra'suhu qabla al-imam. And you Allah ra'suhu ra's himarin. He said, the one who raises his head up before the Imam does in the prayer, isn't he or shouldn't he be afraid that Allah may change his head or will change his head from what it is right now, the head of a human being, to make it into a head of a donkey? Again, that's a characteristic that Allah's Prophet wouldn't connect, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to something that was simple and easy. Khafif, hayin, layin. He's only going to make that something big. So the scholars had ikhtilaf. What did it mean by this particular hadith? To change his head into a head of a donkey. Some of them said, and this little hadith, just as we take the names and attributes of Allah, just how they come, without explaining them away, we take them apparently. The scholars said that his face will be changed into a face of a donkey now as punishment now while he's living because he's doing that crime. And I believe we told you about the incident that has been mentioned in the book, Fathul Mulhim, Fi Sharh Sahih Muslim, Ibn Hajar Rahimahullahu Ta'ala mentioned how he himself traveled to Asham to take knowledge from a big scholar who was well known over in that area. When he got to that area, that scholar would only teach him from behind the hijab. When that scholar realized Ibn, Ibn Hajr, Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani, he realized he was far apart in terms of his being advanced. He was better than the other students. So he used to have private lessons with the man. And then after the man began an intimate relationship with the student, he asked him, why you always teach me from behind the hijab? And then he said, okay, I'm going to teach you from without the hijab. And when he took the hijab off, the man had his face look like a donkey. The man said to Al-Imam Ibn Hajr, this is a result of the hadith of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa and that story is famous. Now, we don't have to look at that story. We look at the book of Allah, Azza wa Jal. Allah Ta'ala mentioned, in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْتُمُ الَّذِينَ اعْتَدَوْ مِنْكُمْ فِي السَّبْتِ فَقُلْنَا لَهُمْ كُونُوا قِرَةَةً خَاسِئِينَ And you, Bani Israel, you know those people who are from amongst you who exceeded the limits for the Sabbath. 
you were hunting and fishing on the day of the Sabbath. So as a result of what you did, we changed you into monkeys. So Allah changed human beings into monkeys, changed others into pigs. Akramakumullah. So why can't he change someone who does this in Salat into the head of a donkey? A Muslim doesn't have a problem with that. Somebody who has nifaq or something's wrong with his head, he's the one who's apologetic, shy, and embarrassed for now Muslims to know that he believes that this is something that can happen. And why should we be embarrassed as we sit right here and all of those ayahs of the Quran where Allah Ta'ala addressed Bani Adam when they're mutakabbi, they have kibr, and Allah is telling us, you people were created from sperm, and here you are right now sitting right here. Why can't he make the person's face into a donkey? He used to be a sperm and look at him right now. So that's one opinion. Another opinion is, this is what's going to happen to the individual Yom Qiyamah. Because he didn't pray and he was racing the imam, so he didn't pray with discipline. Yom Qiyamah, Allah is going to change his face to a donkey. Allahu Alam. Third interpretation of the ulama of Islam is, the changing of his face into the donkey means, like the donkey can't see with basira, insight. He can see with his eyes, he knows where he's going, but he can't see with insight. He doesn't understand, he doesn't hear with fahim. So Allah Ta'ala changes the face of the person into a donkey by taking away his ability to comprehend. He becomes like the donkey akramakumullah. The important thing is, is something that shouldn't be done. And as we mentioned, Ikhwani, there is absolutely no benefit in this issue whatsoever. The companions of the Prophet, like Al-Bara ibn Azib, he said that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would pray, and whenever he would say, Allahu Akbar, and go into the position, he said, we wouldn't move until he took his position. And they used to rely on the people in the first row to be the munabbihin. The people in the first row were the ones who would allow the other people to know when to move. The people in the back would not move based upon hearing the sound. They would move based upon seeing what people did in front of them. So the people in the first row would not go into sajda until the Nabi was in sajda, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They wouldn't sit up until he totally sat up. They wouldn't stand up until he stood up. So there's no benefit. And look what happens to this individual. Subhanallah. Al-Imam ibn, ibn al-Jawzi, ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawzi, Abu Faraj al-Jawzi. He has a book that's called Talbis Iblis, the way that Iblis makes tricks on people. In one of the chapters, he talked about the person who comes to the masjid early. And when he comes to the masjid, he's really diligent and he's really committed to making sunnah prayers. He read the hadith, Man salla lillahi ta'ala fi yawm ithna asha raka'a ban allahu lahu baytin fil jannah. Anybody who pray 12 raka'at, sunnah, during the day, Allah build a house for him in jannah. So he's serious about that. He comes to the masjid. He'll make tahiyyat to masjid, and then he'll make two rakats before dhuhr, and then two more before dhuhr. He'll make them sometime two, and then two. Sometimes he'll do four. And he's doing that every day. And then he comes to the prayer, and in the prayer, he's racing with the imam. So the sunnah, he's really on top of the sunnah, and he's taking care of the sunnah, but what's wajib, he's destroying it. Because that's shaitan playing with him. And that's part of the meaning Innama. It's part of the meaning of the hadith that we mentioned that his head, innama nasiyatu biyad shaitan. His head is his forehead is in the hand of a shaitan. You get the reward. It's like fasting in Ramadan. The one who doesn't pray, he's not fasting. We're not going to say, as we heard from some people, the one who doesn't pray salatul tarawih, he doesn't have any fast. We're not going to say that. But the one who doesn't pray and he's fasting, la soma lahu. He has to fast. Oh, wallahi, that fast is not accepted. Because the salat and not praying the salat destroys your deeds. Salat al asr and leaving it destroys your deeds. Similar to this, the individual is praying the sunnah prayers and he's on top of that and he's disciplined. And then when it comes to the issue of his fardu prayer, he's racing with the imam. And one of the worst people who do that, or one of the most popular times, is in the Kaaba. In the Kaaba. And whenever we make Umrah or Hajj, 
we always give a class to the pilgrims that we're going with some of the common mistakes of the pilgrims. People making Umrah and Hajj. And from those mistakes is when the people are praying in the Kaaba on the ground, many people will get up before the Imam says, Assalamu alaikum wa Before he finishes, he would get up, say salam himself, and run so that he can kiss the Kaaba. And that's in contradiction of the Sunnah. Because the Prophet used to kiss the Kaaba the وسلم, after making tawaf. After making tawaf, he would go to the Kaaba, to the black stone. While making tawaf, he would kiss it. After making tawaf, he would kiss it. Go by the door, make dua. But he wouldn't just come into the Kaaba and just go to the black stone and kiss it. He wouldn't just come into the Kaaba and make Turak, I go to the black stone and kiss it. It was always connected to the tawaf. Now I'm not saying that a person who goes into the Kaaba, he can't kiss the black stone. You could kiss the black stone, but the sunnah is, the kissing of the black stone is connected to the tawaf. That's when the prophet did it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the individual, he jumps up after the prayer, before the imam completes it, and he kisses the black stone. This is something that shouldn't be done due to the fact that there are many prohibitions from the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, concerning it. No benefit and being in a rush. No benefit. From those issues is the opposite of that. From those mistakes is the opposite of that. The opposite of that are the people who take a long time after the imam does something. And this is common, Ikhwani, especially to people making toba, especially to people who really like salat, reverts, someone who's really into the salat. This is something that also should be avoided. The imam, he makes sajda, and the people go into sajda, and the imam comes up from sajda, and he's still in sajda. The person who's praying is still in sajda. And the imam may be in the tashahud, and he's still in sajda. Or the imam may have stood up, and he's still in sajda. This is a mistake, and it should be avoided. Because of the hadith that we mentioned so many times, that's a principle in so many aspects of the salah. إِنَّمَا جُعِلَ imam لِيُؤْتَمَّ بِهِ the imam has been made to be followed. The imam has been made to be followed. If he makes ruku', you make ruku'. And if he comes up, then you come up. So that goes to show there has to be some tartib that you have to follow the imam with mutaba'ah, you have to follow him, and you have to do what he does after he did it. So the delayed sajda or rukur, especially the one where the imam goes into another position, this is something that is in disobedience to what the Prophet brought, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in addition to that, we can add on to that, that sajda that some people make after the salam. Salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. The person makes sajda just like that. Not sajda tasahu, just sajda. I want to be close to Allah, so I'm going to make sajda. This sajda is not from what the Nabi brought us, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. So it also should be something that is avoided. The last one that we want to mention, Khwani, today, bidnillah. So when we come late to the prayer and we didn't catch the takbiratul ihram with the imam, so a person comes to the masjid and the imam and the community are in the ruku'. So while he's bending down, he says, Allahu Akbar for the takbiratul al ihram. That's a mistake. Or the individual, he does takbiratul ihram and he makes the dua while the people are in ruku'. That's a mistake. What should happen is when the person comes late, when he comes late to the masjid, he has two options. One is to say Allahu Akbar takbiratul ihram and just go straight into the position that you found those people in. Just go straight into that position. Just one takbir while standing up because the position of the takbir is standing up and it's not bending down or between two positions. It's when you're standing up, being calm. And he commanded that. He said, when you come to the masjid, come with sakin and waqar. Take it easy. Whatever you made with the imam, it's yours. Whatever you miss, get up and complete it. The second option is the person can make the takbiratul ihram, Allahu Akbar. And then after that, Allahu Akbar again, 
And then he goes into the position. And that's being safe. As Sheikh Ibn Baz, he was of that opinion that that's the safe position. Although many of the ulama of the Salaf said no from Anul Hadith, no. Just one takbiratul ihram to open up the prayer. And then you go into that position that you found the people in. So what shouldn't be done is make it the takbiratul ihram bending down to catch. And the second one is to say takbiratul ihram and then the dua. And we can add on to that. Takbiratul ihram, Allahu Akbar, and then put your hands here, and then Allahu Akbar. You don't have to put your hands there after that because there's no recitation that you're going to do. There's no recitation that you're going to do. So this is a bath and a mas'ala that was dealt with in detail because it's so prevalent by some of the major scholars of Al-Islam. Al-Imam al-Shawkani, Al-Imam al-Nawi, Ibn Qudama, Al-Imam Ali al-Qari, and other than that, wrote a lot of information about this issue and the position of the ulama because it's one of the common mistakes. So we're going to open up the floor to your questions, inshallah, if you have any First question was the question of the permissibility or impermissibility of bending down and walking to the masjid to join the salat. This is something that is permissible. This is something, Allah Akbar, in Ruku, and you can walk to the saf in that condition, inshallah. Fadl ya. No, no, when the person comes into the masjid, the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, go into the position that you found the people in. So when you come in, if they're in sajda, they did the first one, and you know that's the first sajda because you came in, and they're in the sajda. Then they sat up and they went to the second sajda. Well, you don't wait for them to get up. You get into the position that you came in on, and that's the command of the Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tafadhiya. Go ahead. come to the Saf and the Imam is in Rukur and he says Semi Allah if you didn't hear it if you didn't say it although his movement preceded the statement if you didn't hear it inshallah you got into that Rukur position then you get it and that's because of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Man adraka al raka, faqad faqad adraka salah. Anybody who caught that raka, then he caught that thing. So you didn't hear him, and you're in that position. You in that position, muntasib. You're there, thabit, and he came up, and then he said, "Sami Allah li man hamid." After standing up, you got that raka, inshallah. Abdul Qadir. What I know, Akhi Abdul Qadir, is that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would elongate his takbir when he wanted, or his taslim. He wanted to give one salam to the right. He would say, As-salamu alaykum. That's all I know. I don't know anything else in the last rakat. When you want to sit down, you say, Allah, I don't know anything about that. Maybe people do that just because they do it. Who knows? Fadl ya No, no, if they sit in the chair, you have the right to sit in the chair. There's no problem with sitting in the chair. The Prophet prayed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the middle of the people as the imam, as the imam, and he also prayed in the middle of the people in the first row, behind the imam. So someone who has to sit can be anywhere in the saf. So to say it's better, we need is some delil to say that it's better. We know the right side of each row is better than the left side. 
So the best row is the right side of the first row. And then the left side. The best row is the right side of the second row. And then the left side. And so forth and so on. So we have Dalil for that. But to say it's better to put the chair here or there or there. When we found that the Prophet Wasallam prayed sitting down as the Imam. And he also prayed sitting down in the first row. We can't say that. Uh, we do have the issue of um, conformity. The issue of um, keeping the rows straight and things like that. Sitting in the chair. Where are you going to put the chair? When I sit down, am I going to be even? Am I going to be up? So those issues, a um, person just has to make HD hat on them. But a uh, person anywhere. From the issues of the prayer, Ikhwani, and we mentioned this from the mistakes, is that not every ordinary Amr, Bakr, Zaid should pray behind the Imam. The person who should pray behind the Imam are the Qurra, the Hufab, the Fuqaha, the people who know what they're doing. Before he used to pray, he used to tell the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let the elders, the more knowledgeable people, pray behind me. That was from what he used to say before starting the prayer. So the ulama, when Umar radiallahu anhu was stabbed by the man for Salat al-Fajr, he turned around and he grabbed Abdurrahman ibn Auf, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, and he brought him forward. And he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. He got, came forward and he read a small surah. He didn't read Surah Al-Baqarah and Ma'ida and the Amir al-Mu'mineen is stabbed on the ground. The ignorant person, he'll come forward and you see that the Amir al-Mu'mineen is stabbed on the ground. So he thinks he has to make the Salat long in the hopes that Allah gives him Shifa. The one who has Fiqh, he says, no, we better get, we better get tend to him. So I told you, brothers, if you're a person who's standing behind the Imam and you look around and you see someone who has more knowledge than you, more Quran than you, then offer him to come. You're going to get the reward for standing there. So the imam breaks his, breaks his wudu. He turns around, he looks, and he just grabs that person. He lets that person know. And he could talk to him. See, the ignorant person, if you're ignorant, and the imam is trying to say, come forward, he'd be like, what are you doing to the imam? He said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Whereas the person with knowledge, he knows what to do. Just grab him. He'll, but most people will know. There's another issue, Ikhwani, um, before I forget, about the salaf and dealing with I told you that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam addressed the community and he told the community, don't race me in the prayer. Don't move before I move, equal to me or before me. There is some narrations that Muawiyah, when he was the leader of the Muslims, he used to say the same thing. He said, I put on some weight. So I don't move as quick as I used to move before. Don't race me in the prayer. So he addressed the community. But the one that I wanted to, to mention very quickly was the Athar. Ibn Kathir brought the Athar in his book, al Bidayah wa Nihaya, about Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi, who was a big oppressive guy. He was praying next to the Tabi Sa'id ibn al Musayyib, one of the seven fuqaha in Medina. And he was racing with the imam. And then after the prayer, the scholar, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, made inkar before al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was a leader. He was just a regular person. So he made inkar, asking him, what kind of prayer are you making? You don't know prayer better than that? That prayer that you just did is no discipline. You were doing before the imam and with the imam. And he got on him. Time went by, al-Hajjaj became a leader of the Muslims. And he was an oppressive leader. And when he came back to Al-Medina, and he became responsible for Al-Medina, he saw Sa'id, Ibn Al-Musayyib. And the people thought it was going to be a problem, but he appreciated what he did for him. Anyway, ultimately, this scholar, Sa'id Ibn Al-Musayyib, he saw the permissibility of Al-Khuruj. When the bad leaders were there, he said, yes, revolt against them and fight them. And he's a serious, bona fide scholar. We don't take the mistakes of the scholar, no matter who he is. So the people who see Khuruj, they always say it as if it's some big shuba. It's no shuba. He was wrong, rahimahullah. But anyway, he ultimately killed Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. He lost his head, chopped his head off. But that was after. 
So the reason why I'm bringing this to your attention is people will use that as a delil to show you could talk mean and bad and nasty to people in authority because the leader was making a salat that was in discipline. Saeed ibn Musayyib got on him and he said really tough words. But in actuality, all of that incident happened, transpired before, before Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi was the leader. So we just want to let you know that. Last question. I think I saw somebody's hand. Fadhi ya akhi. Akramakullah ya akhi. Well, concerning the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha, for anybody who's praying the prayer, the hadith of the Nabi is clear. He told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La salata liman lam yaqra bi fatiha til kitab. No prayer for the one who doesn't read Al-Fatiha. If you make salah by yourself, or you make salah in a low voice, and you don't read Fatiha, you don't have any prayer. The recitation of the Fatiha is a rukun from the arkan of the salah. As for reading behind the imam, the imam is there and you're in the thing. It's an issue of ikhtilaf. I didn't say that that's da'if. There are proofs that would allow you to do that. The prophet was praying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After salat he said, who was that? Who was that that was yunazi'ni fi salat? I'm reading and someone else is reading. Who was that? The man said, it was me, ya Rasulullah. He said, don't do it. Don't read what I'm reading. Except Surah Al-Fatiha. So that's a strong delil. And that's why we find the ulama of Alul Hadith, there are many of them are on that opinion. And this Jam'iya Alul Hadith, many of the people from the ulama are on that opinion real strong eh, from Jam'iya Alul Hadith. But I said, I believe that that position is the weaker position, it's not the strongest position. And like we mentioned, from those reasons is when the Imam reads the Quran, you listen to him and you pay attention to what he's saying. But if you feel that that is something that you want to do or should be done, then wait until he's finished. And then when he starts reading another surah, then you read. Because if he reads a surah and you read a surah, he reads a surah, you're, it's tashwish. Tashwish on you. Tashwish maybe on the people who are next to you. And Allahu A'lam. And this is one of the mas'alas. This is from the masail that are kind of like... Um, has a lot of ikhtilaf in it, and it's, prob it's problematic. And Allah is Allah and Alam. We're going to stop here, inshallah. We have a, a week left, less than a week left, inshallah, for Ramadan Mubarak. May Allah bring it to us. Allah khair. Give us tawfiq, inshallah, to fast it. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam mubarak ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. is on tomorrow, man. If I had some